the activities. We're going to be talking about communism. How can we best meet the threat of communist aggression? Uh, first of all, from Norway, is Gunnar Aslan. Uh, originally from Norway, but out in Palmerston, Pennsylvania in these last two weeks, he's become really a part of the school. Gunnar admitted to me that he even took the test with the German class, and uh, he says he got the lowest mark. But I learned from somebody else that although he's not played basketball before he came to the United States, he helped out in a practice game and made eight baskets for his team. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was just your six good. feet four height that did it, Gunnar. I don't know. Good. Next is uh, Vangala Jayaram from India. Not unusual that he should be traveling at this early age. Uh, Ram's father was a peasant's son. He somehow, though, got himself in the employ of a Japanese merchant who took him to Japan and then to San Francisco, and before very long, Ram's father had himself a PhD at Harvard. Ram has been for this past two weeks in the High School of Performing Arts. He says he's experimented not only with modern dance, but has also perfected his bunny hop. True? <laughs> You're expert now, aren't you, Ram? Uh, over here is Johnny Antelone from the Philippines. Johnny's won every possible prize in his school back in the Philippines. Uh, for the last two weeks, he's been up at Fordham Prep. Although he already speaks more than nine languages, he tells me he's been learning Greek and Latin at Fordham. Well, just two weeks of it, anyway, Johnny. Yes. Uh, Johnny said just a moment ago when we were talking that the thing that really impressed him most about America is the fact that none of the houses here in this country have bars on their windows. Uh, the fourth uh, student here with us tonight is Chin Tai Kim from Korea. Kim's hometown is in Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea. His father's a Methodist minister, and because of the persecutions of Christians in Korea in early 45, he took his family to China, to Peking. Fortunately for the family then, they were not in Pyongyang when the war started. They had returned to South Korea, Pusan, and then in Seoul, so the family is together. Kim has just come from an assembly, I think, kind of a surprise assembly at New Rochelle High School. The students, during the two weeks that Kim has been there, had raised $180 to support a Korean war orphan for one year. In addition, they gave the boys several other gifts that I know they'll prize when they go home. Well, now, how about this question of communism? What are your answers to the question of how do we best meet the threat of communist aggression? Kim? I come from Korea. In our experience, we must meet force by force. You agree, no, Johnny? I don't agree. I'm from the Philippines. And in our experience, I believe that the best way to fight a communist is to make him a capitalist. I am from Norway. I believe that it is wrong to use Soviet methods to suppress the communists. How about you, Ram? I am from India. The best way to resist communist aggression is to increase solidarity in the free world so that they don't uh, pick us off one by one. But Ram, in that case, if you really believe that solidarity in the free, free world against communism mm -hmm. is the best way to fight communism, how then do you account for India's neutral stand? Oh yes, that's very interesting. India is neutral because India does not want to feel, India and incidentally many, many nations of Asia, that they belong to one of the two camps. Because if they feel that they belong to one of the two camps, they feel they have to fight. And one thing that the Asians would not like to do now is to fight. Are they afraid to fight? They are not, they are not uh, prepared to fight, they are not willing to fight, and they know that the one thing that will destroy them now is to have to fight. Precisely, they are not prepared to fight. Should they therefore not align themselves with some powerful Western country who can give them the means whereby they can be prepared to fight? That will only inevitably bring them into the struggle. That means they express their willingness to fight but by joining one of the two camps. Yes, Don't you think it is much easier to prevent the struggle by making the democratic countries so strong that uh, an aggression from the communist countries looks improfitable. Precisely. I believe that if India and every other country against communism were to join a sort of worldwide organization so that they could present to the United, to the Russians or to the communists that if they touch one member, the rest would come to its aid, then aggression would really seem very unprofitable. But India feels that if you ha if India joins the American bloc or is with one of the two camps, whether it be the Russians or the Americans, then it only invites you to directly come in. Whereas if it stays out, it's, uh, it just doesn't have to come in. It is not a part of the program. Ram, I, I have a question. What shall uh, the Indian people do if India is uh, aggressed by communism? Well, if India is, it will have to meet the aggression to the extent that it can. And it will, 
It'll, the other countries may help her to meet that aggression. If they don't, well, they don't. Then India has to face the aggression herself. If they do, as we helped you in South Korea, then it's all the better. We helped you in South Korea to meet aggression. We are against aggression, whether it be Western aggression or communist aggression. What about the point you started with, Ram, the need for an Asian federation? Yes, I think that the uh, Asian federation is the first step in this direction. If the, all the countries of Asia begin to feel this way, that they are uh, separate, and yet they have to meet aggression and communist aggression when it has to be met, then uh, the best way is to follow the policy of neutrality as is followed by India. Where are we getting on this idea of uh, federation in Asia? You from the Philippines, you, some of your people have had a leading part in the idea. What's the future of it? We believe that when countries in Asia can look upon Asian federation as a proper step and divorce themselves from any feeling of extreme nationalism, then this federation will become prosperous and will prosper. But where will, would such an Asian federation stand in the world complete of today? Naturally, the Asians want survival, not only for themselves, but for their friends in the free world. Therefore, if anybody's hurt in the Western world, the Asian Federation shall go to its aid. Because the Asian Federation cannot defend Asia alone. Before it can defend Asia, it must also be prepared to defend the Western Hemisphere. But Johnny, let's be specific. The countries of Asia didn't even get together on their Korean policy. What are the practical possibilities of Asian Federation? As I told you, on theory, well, the practical possibility and the facts that exist today are this. Asians are jealous of each other, suspicious of each other, and they're not willing to join with each other. Oh, no, I don't agree well, there. I think that an Asi an, a European federation, on the other hand, is far more utopian to think of. An Asian federation is not only inevitable, desirable, but practicable. And it is because uh, all the countries of Asia have so much in common. They've all just uh, become independent recently. And in fact, in the struggle for independence, they have combined. India helped Indonesia to become independent. And after becoming independent, they are all faced with identical problems, with problems of internal communism and with problems of a possible communist menace being so near Russia and China. Ram, why do you say that European Federation is far more utopian than Asian Federation? Would you agree with that? No, I don't think uh, I would agree at all. I think that uh, in uh, almost all Western European countries, you find the, that the uh, People are very afraid of uh, communist aggression and the, they feel that the, the only uh, proper thing to do is to unite their defenses to make such uh, aggression unprofitable. And the, I haven't always seen such willingness to cooperate in Asia. No. What did you well, want to say? Wait, wait a minute, Kim's turn. Mm. Well, now in Asia, which has been uh, occupied by uh, European people or by Japanese people, I think nationalism is growing very rapidly. And uh, I think uh, Asian people aflame uh, with nationalism are apt to be uh, skeptical uh, towards each other. That's true. But now when communist uh, uh, challenge is universal against uh, all the national sovereignty of Asian people, I think it is very emergent for the Asian people to establish a fabric, uh, no matter it is uh, a Pacific Defense Pact or uh, something else. I think it is very uh, emergent to establish a fabric. But uh, how to develop so intense nationalism to some form of internationalism? That is the question. Yes, and, uh, I, yes. Mm, I agree is, with you. It is, I up to, uh, it is up to the tempo of the development of Asian, Asian people's outlook toward the world. Yes, I agree with you there. And uh, I think uh, maybe I was a little unjust because Europe, uh, most European countries became independent about a uh, hundred years ago yes. and it took them such a long time to get into a uh, federation or to unite their defense yes. while uh, most but Asian countries are very young and uh, therefore uh, I think it's much more difficult for them to mm -hmm. see yes. the necessity of such. What, hap just what happens? Just but good just minute, Kim. You see Kim, though you are an Asian and uh, I would like you seem to agree with, and there I want to point out one thing that Europe a hundred years ago when nationalism was rising in Italy, in Germany, and in France, and so on, is not the same as Asia now. The kind of nationalism that we have in Asia now is born out of imperialism. The kind of nationalism you had was different. It was not born out of imperialism. So how can you compare the two? And this nationalism will not in any way be an obstacle to uh, Asian Federation. It will only help it. Do you agree with that, John? I would say now that although it took Europe a hundred years or so to do it, Still, Asians realize and they know that they do not have the hundred years with which to wait. They know that they must federate at once as soon as practicable. 
Yes. And why should they wait as long as Europe? They have the example of Europe to go by. What made Europe so long in uniting or in trying to unite was that they had to do this hit and miss method. While Asians can always look at the example of Europe. There is no reason except nationalism to prevent federation in Asia. And I do maintain that nationalism is trying to keep a country distinct, a distinct personality for that country, that this is what will prevent Asian federation. I assume you're talking about an Asian federation that would be countries uniting in opposition or in defense of communist aggression. Uh, of course, the UN is the worldwide body in which these regional federations can take part. But inevitably, we come to the question, as we talk about Asia, what's going to happen to communist China? And I'd like to know what you think about whether we should let China into the United Nations or not. Well, up to several months ago, Chinese communists uh, were killing Korean people and uh, 16 uh, uh, nation soldiers in Korea. And uh, the point is that can Red China come to the United Nations with unclean hands? Can Red China be the member of United Nations with the hand uh, dripping in blood? That's the point. That is a very fanatical point. Now, wait point. a minute. Fanatical wait a minute. Point. Well, no. I think Johnny was first. Go ahead. <laughs> I just want to say, Kim, that the peoples of Asia recognize the morality of your stand, that it is indeed immoral and morally evil to admit Red China into the United Nations. Mm -hmm. However, I maintain that, if we can, that we must be prepared to use Red China's desire for admission into the United Nations mm -hmm. as a bargaining point. If in exchange for our admission, we can get the unity of Korea, the withdrawal from Indochina, the withdrawal from Malaya, the cessation of her subversive activities here and abroad. Well, but then I, I believe that would be sufficient trading for her to enter into Red China. Yes, but I think uh, the United Nations is an organization built on principles. Yes. You shouldn't bargain in the United Nations. Therefore, I think that uh, it would not be possible to admit Red China before you have reached a final agreement in Korea. Yes, I agree. No, I don't agree. I, now look, is he, wait a minute, Johnny. Is answer? Answer? All right, go ahead and answer. I just want to say that Unless you're prepared to do an, to have an all-out war in Korea, then the only way of uniting it would be through negotiation. Now I ask you, when you come to the communist table, the negotiation table, what will you offer the communists in exchange for the unity of Korea? All right, I'll answer you this. You said that to admit communist China into the United Nations is a moral evil. That's first of all wrong. And secondly, you said to admit communist China into the United Nations is expedient. I want to say that to I admit... I didn't say expedient. I just said morally evil. Yes, but you, the second part of your statement was that it's good to admit it. You have to anyway, bargain with it. You have yes, to you have to bargain. I think that by admitting them, you lose all bargaining. I mean, you lose any scope or any possibility of arriving at a decision. But and as for the moral evil, I think the only basis on which China can come, Red China can come into the United Nations is a moral basis. You cannot keep 400 million people out of the United Nations. And the basis for their coming in is an only moral and not uh, now, expedient. Now, look, Ram, I didn't say that you had to let China come in and then bargain. I said, bargain first. And if she meets our demands, then let her come in. That would be fair exchange. No, I think morally you should let them come in. But from I the know. point of view of expediency, it is not desirable. Uh, Johnny, uh, you said, one of you said just a moment ago that you will never settle this question about uh, China getting into the UN or not before we've settled the Korean question. I would like to know, since we've got Kim here and you and the rest of you, what you think the future is going to be in Korea, let's say, in the next 10 years, what do you foresee? Well, um, from absolutely Korean point of view, I am impelled to say this way. We have only two alternatives. 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 alternatives uh, to let our country divided into two parts or to fight for unification. Only two alternatives. Uh, but to uh, let our country divided, that means this penalty to Korean people. That there means death penalty, you Yes, say? yes. Death penalty to the Korean people. There are many reasons. The first reason, economically speaking, uh, North Korea involves a great industrial part, and the South Korea is only agricultural part. And the agricultural products are almost all uh, consumed within Korea. So we have not got uh, exports economically. So only when our country is unified, uh, we can uh, survive. That's the problem of to be or not to be. For so Korean you people. say you'll either have to fight or yes. remain divided, but remaining divided, as far as you're concerned, is not a possible mm -hmm. alternative. Mm -hmm. You're next. But do you think it is possible for two people, for two countries, to fight against each other to become one country? 
But Korea is not two countries. It is one country. Yes, but how the division of our country is fight against absolutely each other? artificial and arbitrary. I think he means, don't you destroy a country by the act of half the country fighting against the other half of the country? Wouldn't that also destroy the country? Yes, Kim, you've got to take into consideration a third alternative. I do recognize that Korea is one country, and to have it divided into two is an artificial division, mm -hmm. because the people of South Korea feel much closer to the people of North Korea than, de than they feel to the Americans there or to the Indians there or to any other people fighting with them now. And therefore, this division of Korea is never a long-term arrangement. But you can decide the Korean issue by a plebiscite. Have a plebiscite in the whole of North and South Korea. As one I country. have a question. How, will can, how, how can you ensure the survival of Korean people? How can you ensure the survival of Korean people in the future without unification? Yes, unify them, but give all of them a chance to decide their future. Give all the people of, the, of Korea, North Korea and South Korea. But we know so well about the future. We can predict. I would like to say one thing. You said that the plebiscite would be the ideal means of uniting this country. Not of uniting, of solving the problem. All right, of solving the problem is unity. Future. So it is uniting. Yes. There, uh, yes, of course. Then, therefore, the problem is this. South Korea is willing to hold a plebiscite, mm -hmm. but North Korea under its communist masters is not willing to hold a plebiscite. Therefore, that alternative cannot be. And as Chin Tae said, there are only two alternatives. Uni unity through negotiation or unity through arms or force. It is true that it is not simple to hold a plebiscite. That is why this alternative has all the more to be explored. And uh, some auspices uh, must be found under which this uh, plebiscite can be held, either a small country or a big country or an independent country, or a neutral country, or a, a European country, or an Asian country, it has to be mutually decided. That brings us right back to bargaining, Ram. In order to convince the communists to allow this plebiscite to be, what are you going to offer them, or what are you going to do to them, or what are you going to tell them? Well, I would say that India could hold the plebiscite. But would India offer? Well, if it is mutually decided, why should India offer anything? If, if, if mutually the South Koreans and the North Koreans agree, to any third party, whether it be India or any party. So how are they going the to plebiscite. agree, therefore? They should agree. Through how negotiation. They, through negotiation. Therefore, well, that is still the second alternative. Let me talk about the political yes. conference. All right. Oh, well, I think You mean the conference that's going to be held in Geneva? Well, uh, any, any conference, any conference talks with the communists. Oh. Well, I think uh, Indian people, uh, I don't know about the Filipino attitude toward the conference, but <laughs> as far as I know, uh, of course, not only Korean people, but also all uh, people in the free world want to solve international problems peacefully uh, by talks. But that's the point. Can the communists be politely invited to withdraw of their own free will from the territory for which they fought for three years to retain? That's the point. Certainly they cannot be politely invited to withdraw. That's foolish. That's very clear. So However, impactful. that's right. However, if you could offer them something in exchange for their withdrawal, don't you think that it might perhaps be possible? That's the base of a recognition of China to the United Nations? That's right. Yes, you must That is the basis. But uh, there is the uh, problem of principle. On principle, principle, you must recognize it, not on expediency <laughs> necessarily. That's what I say. Principle of the United Nations. Do you recognize that the go communist government of China is the effective government of that people? It is not the government of China. It is a bandit government. It is possession of China, but not the right to own China. There is a distinction between possession and ownership. Well, Why should you recognize you a bandit's it. ownership over something he stole from you? But suppose he owns it now, you recognize that he owns he it. He doesn't own to. it, because he just grabbed it from you. But at present he has it, so you better recognize that he has it. Ah, no, no, no. Perhaps no. you can say that he has it. But when you approve a government is the government, you give it legal status and legal meaning. Yes. Now I ask, yes, right? Now I ask you, are you going to give legality to their banditry? You are going to give legality to the fact that they are the effective government of the people and that therefore those people can only be represented through that government and must be in any international body which claims to be international. I would have agreed to that the, if it had been a couple of years ago before China had intervened in uh, South Korea Mm -hmm. But I think that with the present situation, with the China technically at war with the United Nations, it is impossible to admit Red China to this organization. Do you think there are any parallels between uh, Korea divided as she is today and Germany divided? I think it is identical. Just as it is very, it is very artificial to have Germany divided into East Germany and West Germany. 
and uh, because the people of West Germany are much closer to the people of East Germany, and therefore there again I, su I suggest a plebiscite. The people of Germany should decide their future. Yes, but I want to bring out one point. Although Korea is unwilling to remain divided, still the West Germans, although they're cut off from their eastern half, the West Germans are doing the best with what they have. Yes, uh, South Koreans are also doing the best, well, but they want to be united, don't they? Would you give me the technical method how to give uh, Korean pe to give to Korean people the opportunity to decide? That's right. Yes, that's what I'm saying. How that a, a mutual body has to be agreed upon. The North Koreans and the South Koreans must agree to some third party. Well, Would concretely speaking, that's a general election all over our yes, country. Yes. But if we hold general election all over Korea, mm -hmm. it is too obvious that communists will lose because yes, then, then there should be an election. That's why they. There should be an election. If they lose, they lose. That's but the all. point is that will communists uh, accept? They should accept. That's what. And that they is, should accept. And they, they will only realize. accept if you are prepared to negotiate with them. And they'll only negotiate if you have them in a body which negotiates, which is the United Nations. If you don't have them in the United Nations, they won't negotiate. And if they don't negotiate, you have to fight. Certainly if not. If you're prepared to fight, then keep them out. No, we'll just if you want to negotiate, keep them in. You can negotiate with them even outside of the United Nations, you know. That is what they have been doing in Korea. But isn't it much better to have them in the United Nations when it you have... It may be much better, but still you can negotiate with Red China outside of the United Nations. What I'm trying to point out is this. If you admit Red China to the United Nations, before you bargain with them, you lose anything that you might have to offer. So that you go to the negotiation table with no aces at all in your hand. Nothing to exchange for what you want from them. You see what I mean? So you have to negotiate with them and offer them as the terms of negotiation, as a price or as a bait, you might say, that if they agree to the unification of Korea and the other conditions I set forth a while ago, then they're welcome to the United Nations. That is the condition sine qua non. I want to come back to uh, United Nations in just a minute to see what your own hopes and uh, expectations of it are. But first, could we ask the spe specific question of what about Japan and rearming of Japan? Is there agreement in this group on what should be done about Japan? And if so, what? What do you think, Kim? Well, um, why uh, let the bygones be bygones? And uh, why uh, work out a uh, new approach towards uh, good friendship with uh, Japan and Korea? That's a good question. Uh, I think Korean people are uh, completely ready to utter amen to this sentiment. But there is an uh, accurate description of present uh, situation. There are many, many complicated international problems between Korea and Japan. I will give some example. The Can you problem, give us just one because we're running short of time? Yes. Uh, the most uh, uh, bitterest issue is the problem of a fishery. Uh, Japanese people are uh, violating the peace line, so-called peace line, proclaimed uh, by a Korean government to protect our fishery. The, procl uh, the proclamation of a peace line is uh, based upon precedent example. For example, uh, the uh, President Truman declared a uh, very similar declaration uh, during the Second World War. But Japanese people are uh, uh, insisting that it is against international law. So That's your point is that, that they have to prove themselves now in their relationships with Korea. That could yes. be a microcosm mm, no. of their good intentions. Do you say then that Japan should be armed or not? Well, I think... If you had to give a yes or no answer, what would you say? I, I prefer um, answering no. How yeah. about you, John? I prefer answering no, but for different reasons. Mm -hmm. I believe that Japan has no reason not to commit aggression in the future. She has less land and more people to feed. No. Although she can increase the productivity of her land, still there is a limit to which food can be produced. There is an optimum limit. In other words, two people can in 10 years have about, let us see now, 50 or 150 descendants while land will just have a point, a saturation point, it can go no farther, while people will continue to increase. Japan's Therefore, past, let, let uh, Ram have a turn. Japan's uh, past imperialism and her militarism has nothing to do with deciding this question. If you rearm Japan, you are rearming yourself. Uh, I think Japan is the gate to the free world. No, yes, no, no, no. I, let Gunnar have a word. I agree. I don't think that the, it is the right to make the minor differences determine such important problems. In the world of today, it is necessary that all democratic countries unite to provide, to prevent communist aggression. And this is the main issue. We have to let all minor issues go. But, that's I, but that is not a minor issue, Gunnar. The army of Japan is a life and death issue to many yes. Asians. 
It is not a minor issue. The whole world, in fact. Besides, if you said that all the democratic countries should unite, I ask you, is Japan a truly reliable democratic country? If it is no, not made it one, is necessary it goes... for the defense of the reliable I democratic agree. country. I agree. I agree with that. But the is Japan is a democratic country to unite with? Yes, sir. The point is that uh, if Japanese rearmament is useful for the total benefit of the free world, why not rearm Japan? But is Japan qualified to be rearmed? Precisely. Yes, of course it is. Well, another well, one of these really complex... Does Japan manifest morality? That's the question. Certainly That's does. the question. Can I ask you from that, to go back to the UN for just a minute, what your real hopes and expectations are? 30 seconds apiece. Well, I think... The UN is the culmination of human progress and is the first step towards the World Federation. And as such, it must be perfectly supported by everyone. Do you believe and in the possibility of a World Federation? I think it is inevitable. It is a logical culmination of historical forces. I believe that the pe people will, and nations will soon come to realize that they cannot live apart from each other. And <coughs> this conclusion will lead them to a World Federation. I have every confidence that the United Nations will succeed. Although when, I cannot say, but succeed it will. Well, I, I'm afraid uh, I'm a little more uh, uh, pessimistic, or uh, because I prefer to call it realistic. But uh, I think that uh, the success of an organization like the United Nations is entirely dependent on the willingness of its members to cooperate. We've got to stop on that word, cooperation. I'm sorry, Gunnar. I'm sorry, Johnny. Uh, but our time is up.